You're listening to Quantum Conversations with Karen Curry Parker. Join us as we explore new frontiers in consciousness, science, and evolution. And now here's your host, Karen Curry Parker. We live in such a tremendously interesting time. A time when the line between science and spirituality are blurring, and we are cultivating the proof that spiritual practices that have been in place since the beginning of humanity are actually valid and powerful ways to harness a greater sense of meaning, access to greater health, and even expanding states of awareness and creativity. The effects of spiritual practices are now being investigated scientifically as never before. And many studies have shown that religious and spiritual practices generally make people happier and healthier. In this quantum conversation, Rupert Sheldrake, the botanist who has, over the span of his career, made evolutionary biologists and other scientists quite nervous by suggesting that evolution and life itself may be more conscious and deliberate than we previously thought. In his new book, Science and Spiritual Practices, Transformative Experiences and Their Effects on Our Bodies, Brains, and Health, Sheldrake shows how science helps validate seven practices on which many religions are built and which are part of our common human heritage. Please join us as we talk about the science of meditation, gratitude, connecting with nature, relating to plants, rituals, singing and chanting, pilgrimage, and holy places. Hi, welcome to Quantum Conversations. I'm Karen Curry Parker. I am excited today to talk to one of my science heroes, Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake is a biologist and the author of more than 80 scientific papers and 10 books. He was among the top 100 global thought leaders for 2013 as ranked by the Duttweiler Institute in Zurich, Switzerland, which is a leading think tank. He's best known for making traditional biologists uncomfortable with his hypothesis of morphic resonance and his research suggesting that maybe evolution is a little bit more than survival of the fittest natural selection and a result of cosmic coincidences. We are going to be talking today about his new book, Science and Spiritual Practices. And uh, in this new book, he talks about common practices that are common in all religions and how these practices have scientific validity and how they are a vital part of creating common human heritage. So welcome, Rupert. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Well, good to be here with you, Karen. Thank you. I, uh, I, I want, there's so much I want to talk to you about. I've been having conversations with you in my head for probably about 20 years now. So it's very exciting to actually have you on the line, but, uh, you know, I read through your new book, Science and Spiritual Practices, which I loved. And one of the things I noticed was that it's a little bit of a different twist for you for based on, you know, in reference to some of your other works. Can you talk to me for just a minute about why you were so intrigued and so compelled to put this piece of information together, which is, as I said, very different than some of your previous work? Well, my previous books are primarily about science, Um, you know, about my ideas on morphic resonance. Uh, In my book, Science Set Free, a kind of critique of the uh, dogmatic, mechanistic approach to science that still predominates. Um, My book on dogs that know when they're coming home, on unexplained powers of animals, uh, the sense of being stared at about unexplained powers (laughs) of people. Um, Those are all scientific topics. Part of my life is, you know, the I I do a whole range of spiritual practices myself, and that side of my life was not in any of these books because Mm -hmm. I'm dealing with objective evidence. Here, I found a way of combining my scientific interests, which are in objective evidence and experimental methods and so forth, with spiritual practices because I suddenly realised that. Actually, most all the spiritual practices I do have actually been studied scientifically now. This is mm-hmm. relatively recent. And the science actually sheds light on the spiritual practices. It helps us understand what's going on. And it also um, 
in every case shows that these practices are actually good for you. So the idea that science and spirituality are somehow either contradictory or have to be kept in separate compartments is no longer true. And so I thought this was a a great theme to write a book about because it could bring together the two sides of my own being, the spiritual side and the scientific side. Um, So that's why I did it. Uh, I I love this, and I especially love this because you... You've talked a lot in the past about you know science set free by you know adding into what I think is more uh, you know the beauty of the mystery. And in this book, you sort of set the the mystery, the spiritual practice free by saying, "Hey, this isn't just stuff we do because it's fun or it feels good. There's actually science behind this, and it's not just science. It's science that, or rather, these are practices as well as science that weave us together." I think, as people across the globe. So I, I just want to, you know, I, I really kind of hammer around, how am I going to do this today? Because there's so much to talk about. So I think what I'd like to do, if this works for you, is I want to go through just just bullet points of these seven practices and sort of just talk about each one and have you just say perhaps a couple of sentences or some insights, some scientific insights related to each of these practices. So the first practice that you talk about is meditation and how meditation is, you know, the science behind meditation. So give me a couple of, of sentences or even, you know, as much as you feel like you want to talk about the science of Hmm. meditation. Well, this is the practice that's been studied the most and there's hundreds, thousands actually of papers on meditation. Some concentrate on the physiological effects, lowering, lowering stress hormones reducing rumination and activity in regions of the brain concerned with worrying. Some of it's on outcomes. People have lower blood pressure, they're less stressed, they sleep better, and they're less depressed if they meditate. In fact, so much so that in Britain, uh, on the National Health Service, in some parts of Britain, you can now go to a psychiatrist who will write you a prescription for meditation if you're depressed, (laughs) um, rather than drugs, because they found it's more effective and more importantly, cheaper from the point of view of the health service. That's an important consideration. So um, I think there's so many studies on meditation, including ones showing which bits of the brain become active during meditation, uh, changes in the brain that happen uh, among long-term meditators. And so convincing is this evidence, and so great are the benefits that meditation is now Uh, being adopted by a great many people who call themselves atheists. Um, Sam Harris, for example, who's one of the so-called new atheists, author of The End of Faith, is now giving online meditation courses. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, this is a real change because previously militant atheists and so-called skeptics were against all spiritual practices. They thought they were a waste of time, rubbish, and so forth. Um, Mm -hmm. Now they've changed their tune. Uh, they're now actually taking up spiritual practices themselves because they think they have clear benefits, not only uh, shown through scientific research, but through their own experience. Yeah. I I, I just think I was listening, and of course, when I was reading, I was laughing. One of my oldest daughters is what I would call a very adamant atheist, but she does Vipassana meditation retreats once a quarter. (laughs) So, um, Well, that's a perfect example, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Let's talk for a second about gratitude, because gratitude is, you know, I think any cynic sort of rolls their eyes at gratitude. Like, what was that? What's that going to get you? What's there to be grateful for? Right. And you talk in this book about the science of gratitude. Talk to us a little bit about what's behind the science of gratitude. Well, the first thing is that positive psychologists, which is the branch of psychology that looks at what makes people happy instead of most of psychology that looks at what makes people miserable. Um, (laughs) The positive psychologists uh, looked at happy people and what is it that makes happy people happy? One thing they found is that happy people are grateful people. And then the critics said, well, of course they're grateful because they're happy. (laughs) Um, So they then did some tests to find out, are they grateful because they're happy or are they happy because they're grateful? And they found that uh, if you take people who don't do gratefulness exercises and you randomly assign subsection in a test, a scientific test, some people get 
gratitude exercises, making a list of things they feel grateful for in the previous week. Compared with people who write a list of hassles in the previous week or uh, just a story about something that happened at a kind of neutral event, the people who actually do this gratefulness practice are measurably happier as a result. And this lasts for days. The exercise they've tried that worked best was where people write a gratefulness letter to somebody who's helped them in their lives, maybe a teacher, uh, who they've never properly thanked. And then they go and read the letter to that person if they're still alive. And people who do that are measurably happier for two months afterwards or more than two months. So what they've shown in this research is that gratitude, which is part of every religious tradition and can be done outside religious traditions too, uh, you know, giving thanks is just part of our heritage. And, you know, if you go to church, then there's sing songs and praise, uh, praise, uh, songs of praise and thanksgiving. All religions have this. Um, And religious people, it's part of their regular practice. But for non-religious people, the benefits are still there through practices of gratitude. So I think the evidence for gratitude being something that makes people feel happier, feel more connected, and as a result, feel more generous and helpful to others is overwhelmingly strong. And Mm -hmm. it's a practice that, of course, like the other ones in my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, um, it's a practice that costs nothing. So that's another advantage. It's free. So far, everything on this list I'm looking at is pretty much free, which is kind of fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next one you talked about was connecting with nature and the science of why this is important and good for us. Yes. Well, there are many people who already have a practice of connecting with nature through going hiking in parks or going spending time outdoors or listening to birds or for that matter gardening or keeping house plants or keeping pets more than 50 percent of american households have pet animals not because they need them but because they want to have this connection with Mm -hmm. animals which remind us of our own animal nature and of the wider natural world um there's now a great deal of evidence that um connecting with nature Uh, benefits people's health. People who take walks in parks or in green spaces or in woodland have lower levels of stress as a result than people who take a walk of similar length in urban settings or down streets or with traffic around them. Uh, So it's not just the exercise, it's the the direct calming effect of um, being in nature. Studies with children show the benefits of being in nature for children less problem with paying attention and um, more sense of connection. Uh, Recent studies have also shown that a lot of modern children spend almost no time outdoors. They're on screens Mm -hmm. um, for most of their waking life, which is really a bad thing. The the Last Child in the Woods is a book that deals with this by Richard Love. And um, uh, he makes a very strong point that this is the first time in human history when we have large numbers of children growing up with almost no contact with the natural world. So, again, there's evidence that contact with the natural world is good for children. The Japanese have a practice called forest bathing, where Mm -hmm. they just spend time in forests. And again, there's a lot of evidence that that reduces stress, uh, lower levels of stress hormone, um, a, a greater feeling of connection. And there's many studies on people who keep dogs and cats showing that um, keeping a pet uh, makes you healthier. It's not just because if you've got a dog, you have to take it for a walk. It works with cats as well, which, of course, people don't take for walks. Um, (laughs) Never. (laughs) Well, it's like herding cats if you try to. Uh, So um, the fact that there's a sense of connection with the animal, it makes people less lonely. People who've had severe operations or uh, disabilities or illnesses recover better and quicker if they have a pet animal. Um, uh, We ourselves had a cat, uh, which my wife called Remedy, because Remedy was a remedy. And um, whenever we felt sad or depressed or uh, whenever we were ill, Remedy had come, seemed to pick it up and come and sit and purr 
uh, in a way that was deeply healing, not just in, in imaginary healing, and it really is healing. There's no good scientific evidence for this. So I think connecting with nature, which a lot of people do anyway, and they don't always think of it as a spiritual practice, but it is a kind of spiritual practice mm-hmm. because it's about connecting with something bigger than ourselves, which is what spiritual practices are really about. Yeah, absolutely. So the next one you you talked about was relating to plants. And I just have to throw this in here because this year in my daughter's classroom, I have an eight-year-old. Um, in my daughter's classroom, I have lots of children, but I, my youngest is eight. They, they, they got a plant, one plant. And the dynamics of how this plant changed the entire classroom, the, ki- my, the kids started taking turns watering the plant. So there was this whole caregiving energy. And then my daughter who brought in the idea that we should all start, they should, all the students should start talking to the plant. So she gave lessons for how they should talk to the plant. So they have a morning routine now where they take turns coming in and speaking words of encouragement to the plant. And then they all decided the plants were lonely. So they all started bringing in more plants. So this, this, classroom that started off with one plant at the beginning of the year has now turned into this giant arboretum (laughs) where they now have this whole system of watering and talking to the plants every morning. Um, But talk to me a little bit about the science of relating to plants, because I don't think that's one we think of a lot other than, you know, going out and hugging a tree. Well, there are two, there are two um, sides to this. I mean, there are many ways we can relate to plants. And one of them is through trees. Many people find that relating to trees is enormously calming and stabilizing. Uh, some people indeed hug them, I do myself. And uh, But just being with a tree, um, because trees are older than us, and um, generally speaking, and most of them live longer than we do, it puts our own life in a kind of perspective. So the science on this, there's not been many studies on sort of tree hugging versus non- non-tree hugging. But all those studies on being in the woods and forests are relevant here, the ones I mentioned already. Um, in a sense, this chapter on relating to plants in my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, is a kind of overflow from connecting with nature. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm so keen on plants. I started out as a botanist, and I've always been keen on plants that I couldn't fit it all into one chapter. So it's a kind of... <laughs> continuation of (laughs) relating to nature. And I think when we see that in the ancient world and in traditional cultures, they have sacred groves where people connect Mm. with the natural world. Here in Europe, many sacred pilgrimage sites, ancient pilgrimage sites, like the uh, Shrine of the Saint Baume in France, in the south Mm -hmm. of France, there's this cave where St. Mary Magdalene is supposed to have lived, and there's a little monastery by it. And the whole thing is in hundreds of acres of primal forest that's never been cut. Everything else in Provence has been cut down, and then you get this scrubby, mackey vegetation. But this is an ancient sacred grove, dates back long before Christian times. Um, But as a Christian place of pilgrimage, the sacred grove has been preserved. And you have this sense of these sacred trees that um, are just respected for being there. And again, going to the places like that uh, has calming and healing effects. Of course, what's happened in the United States is that through the National Park Movement, through John Muir, and inspired by people like Emerson and Thoreau, had this vision of the national parks as nature's cathedrals, as he put it, And some of the greatest sacred groves in the world are in the United States as national parks. Mm -hmm. So one aspect relating to plants is through trees, and another is through flowers. And flowers have this ability to appeal to us, to uh, give us this sense of beauty. And the sense of beauty is itself calming and gives us a sense of connection and purpose and meaning in life, which is very therapeutic. And anyone who gardens is obviously into flowers, unless they exclusively grow vegetables. But even vegetables flower, and peas and beans and so on, and apple trees and whatnot, and fruit trees. But even people who don't grow their own flowers buy them. There's an entire floristry industry Mm -hmm. Um, which is many people, even if they have no garden and no window box and no houseplants, have cut flowers. 
And I recently gave a talk, which is online on my website, sheldrake.org, called Why is there so much beauty in the world? I'm thinking about flowers and how flowers can connect us to that which is beyond ourselves, the source of beauty, which is reflected in so many aspects of nature. And that gives this sense of connection and uh, calm and meaning. And again, there are many scientific studies that show that a sense of meaning and purpose in life is good for us. Uh, Lack of meaning and purpose causes a sense of depression and depression reduces the immune system and our health and well-being. So I think beauty in general, the beauty of flowers in particular, is very therapeutic for many people, including me. As somebody who lives in Minnesota and I've been underneath large buckets of snow for months, I I need flowers. I'm ready for flowers. So, mm. so talk to me now about the science of rituals. You know, why, you know, I I have a very strange background in my childhood and I was sort of raised half Catholic, half Jewish. And of course, there's rituals in both religion, you know, and of course, as a as a young person, I spent a lot of time rolling my eyes at the rituals, but uh, I've kind of come full circle in a lot of ways. Why, Why do we do rituals? What's the science behind it? Well, the interesting, uh, well, first rituals, every religion, every culture has rituals, which is very often involve reenacting some primary event in the history of the group, like the Jewish Passover rituals reenact the original Passover dinner of the Jewish people in Egypt before they were set free from their slavery and bondage and start this journey to the promised land. The Christian Holy Communion is a a Passover dinner itself and reenacts the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples. The American Thanksgiving dinner is a national ritual that reenacts the Thanksgiving of the first settlers in New England. By taking part in rituals, people form a social identity with that group and connect with that group right back to the first time uh, the the act was done, the, the event that the ritual commemorates. So now, why is this powerful? Well, the science behind rituals, I think, is uh, the, the, the thing that explains it best and makes most sense is my own ideas about morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is the idea that there's a kind of memory in nature and that similar things, similar patterns of activity resonate across time. So um, each species has a kind of collective memory, according to this hypothesis. Even the whole of nature does. The so-called laws of nature are more like habits. And morphic resonance depends on similarity. And the point about rituals is they're conservative. You do them the same way each time or a very similar way. And what I think is happening in rituals is that by deliberately doing things in a similar way to the way they've been done before, it creates a resonance between the present participants in the ritual and all those who've done it before, right back to the first time it was done. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what people taking part in rituals think is going on. It gives them this sense of connection uh, and identity um, with the group, the connection with the group, and this connection over the generations. And all traditional human societies have thought of the social group as not just being people here now, but as including the invisible presence of the ancestors and indeed of generations yet to come. And so I think the science um, of rituals, the morphic resonance interpretation, um, makes sense of this very important part of human life found in every religion and in every culture. And um, it gives a sense of connection and identity. And if we feel disconnected and don't have a sense of identity, then we feel isolated and um, depressed. And people who are totally disconnected often feel suicidal. I mean, it's very, very bad for us as social beings not to have a sense of connection and identity. Um, So I think rituals play a really important part, both in individual and in group health. And um, even in secular societies, um, there are these uh, a whole range of rituals, I mean, including things like graduation ceremonies at universities, mm-hmm. um, 
rites of passage of various kinds of rituals, weddings, funerals, are rites of passage, and vision quests. Um, and now a lot of people who are not from the Native American background are rediscovering the importance of vision quests. So anyway, that chapter in my book, Science and Spiritual Practices, um, deals with uh, rituals which uh, the general principles apply all over the world to all different cultures, uh, both within and outside religious traditions. Beautiful. And yeah, and I can imagine too, just the, the healing aspect sometimes of reconnecting back with that lineage too. Oh, so for many people it's very healing, yes. Yeah, that, yes. I, when I, my family comes, they're, they're hidden Jews. So they weren't outright Jewish. They had hidden their Jewish heritage in Germany during World War II. And so when I turned 40, going back and connecting with my Jewish heritage after being sort of raised underground as a Catholic that wasn't really a Catholic, the the feeling of going into synagogue and hearing, it was hearing the Hebrew, like it just triggered something in me that was so familiar, even though I had never had that as part of my life before. So, mm. so singing and chanting, talk to us about the science of singing and chanting. Well, you're, it's a great segue from your, that experience of you with the singing, hearing the chanting of the Hebrew. Um, there's again, all religious traditions have singing and chanting. And in fact, all traditional social groups, every tribe, in the world, every traditional social group has singing, and singing together um, is one of the most powerfully bonding experiences there is. A lot of people think that um, in the evolution of humans, uh, that singing in groups came before speaking, that uh, singing precedes language. And I think it's quite plausible that that's the case. Um, and so what happens when we sing together, or Chanting is like singing, except it's shorter, it's shorter tunes, fewer words. So it's like a more intense form of singing. Um, it's something my wife, Jill Purse, teaches, and I've learned a lot from her about this. She gives workshops on this. Um, and the, by chanting or singing together, what happens is that you have to breathe together. Um, you know, if you're singing, say, a hymn, um, at the end of the verse, everyone breathes, and then you're singing together. So it brings your breathing into synchrony. So the whole group comes into resonance, physiological resonance, and this is measurable. You know, people actually do come into a kind of physiological resonance, but you hardly need the science to see that if you're breathing together, you're coming, being entrained into the same rhythm. And of course, in dancing, uh, which is also part I discuss in this chapter, is part of the power of music, Again, we're all coming into a kind of synchrony, a resonance with each other, which is very, very powerfully bonding experience. So we resonate with each other. Our bodies are literally physically resonating to the sound as we make sounds. What sound is, is resonance. And if you block up your ears and chant different vowels, one of the practices I suggest in, in, in my book, you can actually feel the resonance in different parts of the body of the different sounds. And I think through chanting sacred chants, like um, you know, like in in the Christian service, things like the Kyrie Eleison or the, um, the the Agnus Dei, and or the hymns and the psalms, or in the Jewish services, you know, the the chanting in the synagogue. Um, by doing these ancient chants, we also enter into morphic resonance with all those who've chanted them before. So there's a very powerful connection across time through a resonance across time, as well as the physical and group resonances that are going on in the here and now. And there are plenty of studies now which show uh, the effects of singing and chanting on resonance, on reducing stress levels, on making people feel happier, you know, more closely bonded, um, and so on with others in a group. So I think there's no doubt that singing and chanting can have very powerful positive effects. And I think that's one reason why there's been a resurgence in recent years of community choirs and uh, mm -hmm. choral singing. Here in Britain, at least, there's a big upsurge in community singing. And I think it's because people feel the need for it. 
those who go to church regularly, and I do myself, um, get to sing every week automatically just by going to church. And I like the fact that wherever I am, I go to a service and I find myself singing with people, often people I've never met before if I'm traveling. And, and just singing together with other people has this wonderful sense of rooting you in a community, even if you're just visiting, uh, in a way that just saying hi to people in the street or a brief chat would not do. So mm -hmm. it has this bonding effect on people. Um, and it's uh, it just has, it, I think the need for that, for people who stop going to church or consider themselves non-religious, um, one thing that's lost through that is, is this group participation. You can meditate at home, for example, on your own, but you don't get that bonding that comes through singing with others, that sense of community. It's the most powerful way of establishing community, really. And, and I think that's where the rise of community choirs it plays such an important role. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I think, especially when we think about the voice sort of also being this beautifully vulnerable expression of the self and that willingness to do that in community with others is, is pretty profound. So the last thing you talk about is the science of pilgrimage in holy places, which I think I, I find this of all, I, all of this, of course, is extremely fascinating. But the idea that there's a science behind why we go to these holy places, why we make these pilgrimages. Talk to me about this and, and the impact that this has on people. Well, I think that the pilgrimage is very, very deep in our nature. Um, our ancestors, our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and all of us had hunter-gatherer ancestors um, for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, even before modern humans, the proto-humans and apes were basically hunter-gatherers. Um, um, hunter gatherers have to move around. You you can't hunt unless you follow the animals you are hunting, and they often migrate. So you have a kind of migratory cycle of hunter gatherer societies, um, and to to gather fruits and and leaves and stuff, you have to move to different places in accordance with the seasons. So traditional people often had a kind of migratory. Uh, lifestyle uh, going through these holy places or sacred places. They became sacred because they told stories about them as they went on these journeys. And when they returned each year, they were returning to a place which had its own rituals and ceremonies. And when people settled and became agriculturalists, this need to go to sacred places, particularly for festivals, uh, was very deeply embedded. For example, here in England, Stonehenge that great stone circle and many other stone circles were constructed in such a way that they took on their maximum significance at key points in the year, like the summer solstice. And they were not built in the middle of cities. There were no cities then. People came to them from all over, like they do to summer music festivals today. That's a kind of secularized version. And that was a kind of pilgrimage to the holy place. And then in um, for Jewish people, Jerusalem became a great center of pilgrimage. Jesus himself went to pilgr on, on pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the major festivals, and he walked there. And uh, in medieval Europe, the whole of Europe was crisscrossed with pilgrimage routes. And there's been a remarkable revival of pilgrimage in the last few decades in Europe. The, most, uh, the best known of these is the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Mm -hmm. When it was first revived in 1987, about a thousand people walked there. Last year, three hundred thousand people walked wow. to Santiago de Compostela. And here in Britain, there's a revival of pilgrimage going on to the ancient holy places. Something called the British Pilgrimage Trust is reopening the, the ancient footpath routes across the countryside, not on roads. And um, there's now this remarkable revival of pilgrimage here. So I think. Uh, Pilgrimage um, is important for, for several things, reasons. You're outdoors, you're taking exercise by walking. There's plenty of scientific evidence for that. Plenty of scientific evidence that being outdoors is good for you. Evidence that doing something with a purpose is good for you. It roots you, connects you. And pilgrimage is a journey with a purpose. It's not just going for a walk. There's a goal. And then the holy places towards which these pilgrimages go 
sometimes temples in India, sometimes holy places like the Sacred Mountain, Craig Patrick in Ireland, or Mount Kailash in Tibet. Or uh, they can be springs or trees or groves or churches or cathedrals or um, ancient sacred sites. These holy places have themselves a kind of memory and the um, you can connect with that so the, by going there and they often have a special feeling to them. And that I explain in terms of the morphic resonance idea mm-hmm. that I've already talked about. When a lot of people have been to that place and prayed there or had visionary or ecstatic experiences there or a sense of connection, when you go there uh, after that, you tune in to these previous people's experiences because you're in the same place, the same stimuli. Uh, You're in a very similar position. Your senses are exposed to similar, similar stimuli. So you, as it were, tune into the memory in that place. Uh, of course, this can work both ways. Sometimes there are places with not places of pilgrimage, but often places that are considered haunted or with a bad atmosphere where bad things have happened and you can have bad memories in places. Uh, but pilgrimage places are usually places where there's a powerful connection that other people have felt and that you can tap into by going there. So pilgrimage is a, spirit, a very fundamental spiritual practice found in every tradition and um, undergoing a remarkable revival in Europe at the moment. So I'm just going to read this list to everybody again, because I think this is so important. It's meditation, gratitude, connecting with nature, relating to the plants, ritual, singing and chanting, pilgrimage and holy places. And, you know, the you've done such a beautiful job of sort of giving us a grounding of information that, I think can inspire people to go, okay, I'm not going to just do this because it's a whim or a fancy. I'm not just going to go participate in this activity because, you know, it's, it's the trendy thing to do. There's actually sort of an inner, I think, human directive that you're, you're referring to through all of this writing that says, you know, we, first of all, we have more in common as people than we realize. And secondly, that our own inner drive sometimes to, shake things up by, you know, just something as simple as even going for a walk where we think, oh, it's a way to blow off steam, but it's also sort of a scientific way to sort of get yourself back into connection with not only yourself, but something larger than yourself so that you can create a sense of beauty, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and tap into a different place of creating in your life. And the the fact that you put all these pieces together, and, and I think to a certain degree, give your readers this menu of, hey, if things aren't working or if you're feeling unsettled or you're struggling, here's a a great list to go to and look at, are there options here for you? Scientifically grounded options. This isn't just something you pluck out of your mind. Are there some options on this list here that you can start engaging in? None of these for the most part, except maybe, you know, your pilgrimage, depending on where you decide you want to go, might be a little pricey, but but none of these really is costly. None of these is something that is you know, prohibitive to a certain degree to anyone. There are certainly pieces you can choose from. And I, I, I love that someone with the depth and the understanding and the sheer brilliance of your scientific mind has been able to tie all of these pieces together so beautifully. So thank you so much for that. Any last minute uh, closing comments that you want to make before we before I send people to your website and places where they can go to get more information about you? Well, maybe just to mention that at the end of each chapter about each practice, I do suggest two very simple practices that anyone can do. So if anyone wants to take up one of these practices or to try it out and see how it works for them, I, I do suggest simple things that you can do. And the message of this book really is it's not about dogmas, it's not about doctrines, it's about experience and experiencing it for yourself. And I think that's where the, the, really the basis of all spirituality and indeed religion, it starts from experience. And if we want to, we can do these practices and have this sense of connection and uh, it feels good and it actually is good to do that. 
Uh, absolutely. So you can learn more about Rupert Sheldrake's work. And I encourage you, if you go to this website, it's sheldrake.org, or when you go to this web dra- website, sheldrake.org, go with the awareness that you're going to want to spend a lot of time there. There's an enormous amount of information, lectures, talks, insights. I mean, it's fascinating. I I, I got stuck there this morning in a really beautiful way, um, just kind of getting my getting my last minute bits of information together and uh, you have some powerful information there. So sheldrake.org and Rupert Sheldrake's new book, Science and Spiritual Practices is available on Amazon and other retail book outlets. Go grab a copy. You will, you will walk away after reading this book feeling like you're, you're way more scientific and way more knowledgeable than maybe you've given yourself credit for. And certainly you're way more tuned in and that, the power of connection with source and quantum field or whatever you want to call it. There's, there's more mystery here than maybe there's more mystery and more science here than maybe we thought before. And it's a pretty powerful mind opening read. So thank you again so much, Rupert, for joining us here today on quantum conversations. And uh, I look forward to seeing more of your work and I'm a, uh, still diligently paying attention to my dog who I swear knows way more than I do. <laughs> so. well, it was great talking to you, Karen. Thank you. Most of us who've been on the planet for more than 20 years have been conditioned to see the world in a relatively binary way. Things are either black or white, left or right, masculine or feminine, Republican or Democrat, scientific or secular. Quantum science suggests that it is our perspective that determines how we perceive things. That in reality, we really aren't part of a binary world, but that our experience is simply the expression of a potential along a spectrum of possibility. As we continue to grow in consciousness, we are watching lines and boundaries between what seems like two distinctive halves of a concept melt away, and we are realizing that there may be more to the world than this versus that. Secularism can leave us feeling empty and meaningless. We can fight for the science of why we should save forests, for example, but if we fight merely for the scientific worthiness of life, We miss out on the heart-expanding awe that gives us our greatest inspiration and, as neuroscientists have shown us recently, a deeper connection with our true creative power. John Muir, Aldo Leopold, John James Audubon, even Jane Goodall, and so many other scientists and naturalists before discovered in their quest to understand the science of life that the spiritual significance of life gave them as much understanding as the raw data that they processed. The rules of the material world as discovered by Newton explain a lot, but quantum science is showing us that maybe there's more to the world than pure materialism. And that if we're going to find the elegant solutions facing humanity today, maybe we need to soften the lines between science, spirituality, and consciousness. It is ultimately our awareness of our connection to something greater than our individual self that gives our life greater meaning, opens up our hearts, and inspires us to consciously facilitate our evolution and growth. Thank you for joining me for Quantum Conversations. Please visit our Facebook page and post a comment. Let us know what other Quantum Conversations you'd love to hear. And while you're there, get a copy of your free human design chart and begin your journey to discovering your unique place in the cosmos. I'm Karen Curry Parker. Here's to the continued blurring of the lines between science and spirituality. Thanks for listening to Quantum Conversations with Karen Curry Parker. For more information, visit joyfulmission.com.